Hi, everyone. So first thing I want to make clear is that there is a first rule about Legos use play is that you do not talk about Legos use play because Legos use play is indeed an experience. So I'm infringing the first rule by just doing this talk today. OK. Legos use play method is a facilitated technique for real groups with real problems, which means there is, a, like in the picture, a group of people that need to transition from A on the left column to a B. It's not obvious how to do that, and they will use a facilitator uh, as a sort of guide to find the path from A to B. The domain of application can be business in the broader sense, but it's also team, but it's also individual, so you. And actually, even when you take business type of workshop in the very, very broader sense, you cannot actually avoid by touching also the team and the individual potential domain, just because the methodology is so deep. Lego bricks are so powerful and so cool, and every one of us loves them that we actually can use them in a multitude of ways. Uh, just to be clear, that's the second disclaimer. We don't use Legos use play is not bricks for ice breaking. It's not a team game. Tallest tower. It's not for prototyping. It's not for physical design of spaces and everything. It's not even for visual management. It doesn't take away the fact that it's a good idea to use bricks for that. It's just that it's not Legos use play. So Legos use play core is to build the intangible, something that is hard to visualize until you actually visualize for example let's let's build trust what can you do if someone asks you can you build an example of trust for i could go and, and build a red sofa and say trust is something that when it's there people relax like when you sit on a comfy sofa trust is something that makes you not afraid of taking risk so even putting the hand in the mouth of the shark that's what trust is you know you are less afraid Trust is when you stop planning and you follow someone else's judgment, like in the dog uh, in the woods. So you basically you 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 follow somebody. So that these are three examples of trust that even a kid of nine year old can understand. Okay. So with that in mind, what is the purpose and the promise of this methodology? The purpose is to destroy what we call the broken type of meeting. So the broken meeting syndrome, which means loud people take all the time to talk and quiet people, they never intervene. This is a huge loss in organization. Legos use play was designed to cure this. OK, so that's the disease Legos use play fix. How? By helping people to think first, to communicate after and to problem solve later. So in a specific order, you first think and build, then you communicate and then you problem solve. And by doing that, what you get as an outcome is that people get a huge or higher degree of insights. So they see more things. They are more confident about what they've been talking about. So they actually believe this actually makes great sense. Therefore, they stay loyal for a longer time. So commitment means they act on what they discussed without you following up. Technically, under the you know the hood of the whole thing, there is a core process that is the operating system, and then there is the application techniques, like pretty much the application we run on our cell phone. This is really, really solid and really, really, really reassuring. So anybody can actually learn to master th these things. And even before those, there is a huge amount of science that if it is solid and if it makes sense, then it's a good idea to use Legos Use Play. It is done all through play, but it's not a game, so let's always avoid to make confusion what the word play in English actually encompasses and means. Robert, the, the main architect on the matter, that not, not, and, and also my boss, is always saying if you have all the time of the world to solve an issue, you don't need Legos use play. Okay, so if organization have time and they're not in a hurry, you, you, you can avoid to do that. Otherwise, you better give it a thought. That's that's all for me. You can reach out on LinkedIn on the QR code on the left or on the schedule for becoming a facilitator in Legos Use Play on the red QR code on the right. Thank you. Perfect timing. Thank you very much. And by the way, I think, Carlo, you're giving uh, Legos Use Play trainings in Munich in Germany, uh, if I read that right. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thanks very much. Then we have the Thank next you. one, Tobias, on the stage. You can take control. 
Thank you very much, Simon, for inviting me because LernOS has totally changed my world. I became a uh, LernOS sketch note uh, traveling learner. Uh, and have become a visual storyteller. I'm in China now and I help a German group with its transformation, in particular when it comes to storytelling. So how you tell the story of the change in the organization. That was one of the biggest pain points of managers and sketch notes helped me so much with that. And I just want to um, take you along on my little learning journey, how Learn OS has changed my world. Simon, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was three years ago, it was a 24-hour bar camp where I met the wonderful Moritz Meisner, who said in the chat, does anyone uh, feel like having a sketch note learning path? And I said, yeah, me. So I was part of that together with five other interesting people. And for 12 weeks, with the uh, LearnOS Sketchnote Learning Circle, we learned sketchnoting. I thought it was really cool. I heard about, had heard about it, but I didn't know how to get started. And uh, by learning with the Sketchnote Learning Circle, I have unearthed a treasure again that had been buried for 35 years. When I was a child, I wanted to be a cartoon when somebody asked me, what do you want to be? I said, I want to be a cartoonist. I don't know if you remember these old uh, albums, uh, the empty notepads, and uh, I bought them, and then I used my pen uh, to draw cartoons that I came up with. And that was the treasure that was brought back to the surface thanks to sketch notes, uh, integrating drawings. And this is how I started drawing like mad. I've tried many different things. There were speeches and presentations that I heard and that I found interesting, like this one by uh, Dr. Heike Bruch. I sketch noted that and published it, put it somewhere, posted it, and uh, that found a good echo. And uh, then there was a program strengthening women, empowering women. I accompanied that, and the role model videos uh, were what I sketch noted, and I did it for myself, actually. But uh, I in really put all the details in, and uh, people were interested. And then a year later, Tanya Eggers approached me and asked me if I wanted to um, draw the cover of her book because she liked the style, she thought that it was a perfect match. And this is how it just came. Uh, I was confronted with this very, very quickly and to simplify complex things. And that's a huge advantage uh, of sketch noting. It was during the pandemic and I could try different things and I did different uh, book covers. People approached me here, for instance, uh, Christa Sting, who came to me and said, could you um, sketch out my HR strategy? I need something visual for my students. And uh, so here we have the logistics tanker with her HR strategy in containers, and then Lufthansa process management uh, reached out to me. It's their future vision that I visualized or for EBM past. I had the pleasure to uh, visualize an HR strategy as well. So it started growing and growing. This was paper pencil and then I last year switched to a digital form and that kind of gave me another boost. And I tried to do different things here. For instance, I started to combine photos and sketch notes. So I keep trying new things. And Learn OS was a total door opener and uh, this is how my work as an organizational developer was combined with sketch notes in order to make complex things easy. And it's uh, wonderful to be combined. And I am forever grateful for this experience. And uh, it helped me actually to fulfill my uh, youth's dream, becoming a cartoonist. I could integrate that into my business. And I'm just so happy about it. Thank you very much. Great, this is your round of applause. Thank you, your applause.
Simon. Um, Thank you very much, Simon. And I'm happy to be here. I feel warm, but you probably as well. But it's great to see you. It's a wonderful atmosphere and environment. And today I can tell you something about co-working spaces as a learning environment. I'm Franka. I'm the managing director of Kornberg in Nuremberg. In real life, I do marketing and sales for a logistics company. And the co-working space was founded in 2011. That is already 12 years ago, and this was enough time for me to draw a balance and to tell you my personal story, and it's the first time that I speak about it and have been reflecting about it, so it's particularly a pleasurable moment for me. At the beginning, I thought whether I should speak about desk arrangements and sugar dispenser and how you could use these to promote learning environments. But the more I thought about it, the more I saw, well, it's actually about something completely different because it's not about table and not the tea board and the coffee machine or whatever. It's something different. Everything starts in the year 2011 and I was 18 at the time and had just my A-level exam in hand, that is university entry exam, and I thought, let's do something classical. I was quite good in writing and I thought journalism or German language or literature science, that would be something for me. However, I had a struggle, I had a problem, because I thought Nuremberg is not enough. Where's the subculture? Where's the scene? Where's everything that moves young people? And I thought, maybe I have to go somewhere else. And 2011, um, Berlin. So I had this idea, pondering, and didn't know what to do. And well, in summer, after your A-levels, leaving school, you think all the opportunities are there. But there's also quite a degree of uncertainty. And then, by chance, I was at a workshop for photo reportage and met somebody and they said, oh, we've got a new project. This is co-working. It's totally cool. Don't you want to join us? And I thought, why not? I have a go and join you. And then I sat there on one of these bean bags and had a cappuccino in my head. This is how you did. And the second cappuccino that really came out of this Italian coffee machine and contemplated about mm, what is my situation and what shall I do with my life. And interestingly enough, I thought, well, they're quite nice, these people here. And I really like the atmosphere. And maybe this is what I've been looking for in subculture, in scene, in a space where you can co-create. And I don't know what it was in the end, whether it was the cappuccino, the people, or my mother who said, why don't you stay there a little longer? I didn't go to Berlin, but stayed here. And then I was always at the co-working space. And I couldn't really say goodbye to my idea of a classic career that is university, internship, job. And at the same time, I also uh, registered as a student at Erlangen, which was a complete failure, to be honest. It didn't really work. So reading German language during the day was not really an option. And the alternative which then offered itself to me was so much better, so much more interesting, which had so much more effect on myself because with the co-working space there were so many hackers, startup founders, 2011, that was really very impressive at the time. And they lived according to the credo, well, ideas don't count. It's only what you implement, what you do that counts. And they taught me everything they knew. I would never have thought that I would ever know how programming of a website is done or that I would be standing there and would say, Google Tech Manager, Google Apps, no problem, I can do it. And I would never have thought that edX, Coursera and all these other communities and co-working spaces would offer me that much more than a school or university could ever have shown me. And this is the end. Or the culmination. So it's about the community, the people, and the hosts which design these learning environments. Okay, time's running. Thank you. Hello, Andreas, first of all. Just a quick question. Could you let me know what the slip box actually is? Yes, the slip box. That's personal knowledge management. And basically, it's very simple. All information, all your thoughts, 
put that on a little uh, piece of paper somewhere, but don't leave it there. Start to um, link the information and start processing it. If you have a big idea, make it smaller, con connect different ideas and just take a look at how it gets more and more. So the slip box is not just uh, storing the information in one uh, file, but to actively make use of the knowledge and to uh, process it. That's the basic idea. Oh, that's interesting. That sounds very simple. But does that mean that I can start tomorrow right away? Yes, you can start tomorrow, but as always, the general principle is easy to explain. That's not difficult. But to actually assimilate the principle, that requires a little bit more thought and uh, a little more time because implementing this you will tomorrow well you will take notes for two or three days and then all of a sudden you have questions what how do I um, put these ideas in relations I do, how do I do it do I take it on a notepad one note or how do I create links between the information and that's where the difficulties arise how do I go about this there's many articles books videos on that where the concept is very well presented, but the difficulty is how to put it to practice, how do I start, and once I've started, how do I continue? And this is why, yeah, yes, you can start tomorrow. You can all do that. I would recommend it. And then look for a structure in order to continue to deepen it and to assimilate this, these concepts. So what do you recommend? If I really want to start tomorrow, how do I go about it? Do you have an idea? Well, the good thing is that uh, we, Maris, myself and others, stood before exactly that topic one and a half years ago, and we put together a learn path from what we were observing. And it's in the last approval round, and can be found as a repository. So, I would recommend to start with the LearnOS uh, learning path on the slipbox and to find a learning circle in order to work it out together and to ask your questions in the group, to reflect on that with a guide uh, line that helps you, guides you through it, and to get started building up a slipbox and to fill it with life. Cool, thank you so much. So we're looking forward to seeing all of those who want to come to our session. Yes, then we will see more details and give you a little bit more background information. And uh, we're going to present our learning path. And if you have any questions, you can ask them there. Thank you. That's your round of applause. Dankeschön. Okay, just quickly move forward. Okay, I will tell you something. Thank you for allowing me to speak about the woman in tech MOOC. Next, I just showed you that you can see this later. I'm Anja Wegner of Women Flow, an educational agency in Berlin. And I don't want to talk about MOOC as a learning environment or platform, but I would like to talk about MOOC. What is it? Well, for all those who do not know, but I don't think that this is true. This is a massive open online course. And I think the format of the MOOC as such or as a concept has massively changed in recent years, and tomorrow we can certainly discuss it when uh, I come to the meet to speaker area, and please next. And here, this is why I use the old Jane Hart slide, which is from 2017, because that was the change which came through Web 2.0, so not classic knowledge transfer, but the human being was put at the center, and you are also at a conference where this is about, that is how can you design your learning environment yourself, and this is what it's all about. And unfortunately, this is not an idea that is very spread among population, that is this competence. And please, next, at the bottom, in this learning environment, you saw that the MOOCs are one part of potential learning environments that you can design exactly. 
next to all the other things that are available in that book. And since 2007, many, many other environments were added. But this chart shows you very clearly that each and every one would design or designs his her learning environment for his herself. And what is right for one is not necessarily or definitely not right for the others. So this is the logo of Frona and Move. OK, and then the Women in Tech MOOC, what is this all about? Well, we've got this huge, enormous need for skilled workers and to uh, rediscover women also at a lower age um, as uh, employees. And in our own personal context, very often it's very difficult to get into the tech industries. And we wanted to offer some sources of information and inspiration. And we wanted to present women who did not study a MINT study and still are successful and made a career in this area. So that was the idea behind it. Next. And uh, for this purpose, we did different things. So one was the online course. So you can click on and just click, click. So different women um, were presented and we then interviewed these women. And Katharina, you know her from uh, the LearnOS um, community. She did a sketch note at the end that is summarizing the results of this woman in her tech business and presenting it in a very structured way. I think this is really well done. And these were the women that we interviewed. OK, and then uh, the question was, what can we recommend to other women to enter tech industry? And MOOCs, when I do these interviews, I see that MOOCs have been an enormous learning experience. And so what are the takeaways? And we've got uh, used all the AI tools, uh, transcribing all the videos, putting them uh, into videos. And then we said, can you please put together all the learnings from the interviews? And then seven points were mentioned. And this sounds a bit like a motivational trainer. And you can just click through. Simon, so this is something that you could have imagined originally that is embracing learning, overcoming self-doubt. It sounds a bit like blah, blah. But when you listen to the individual or look at the different video, uh, videos, and when you hear those individual learning stories, then you get motivated personally. That is true for me and others as well. So one is pulling oneself up. You see what is possible. And here I've got a link to a PDF. You can go there immediately. And so, and continue, continue. OK, so this is the MOOC, and this is important. So the MOOC is not the learning environment in itself. That is, we have the understanding that out of a MOOC, so at a different place, so out of the MOOC, we can go to many different platforms and transport little facets to reach the people where they're moving anyways. And then we have Instagram real short passages that we put there in Pinterest, in LinkedIn, and so on. And I think that this is important. That is, we have to get away from MOOC understanding this online course as a learning platform but to see the network. And anything else, you can have a look at my ample slides. All right. So I want to take you on a learning journey. It started in the beginning of the year, in January. Three fantastic companions, Anke, Franz and Ingo and myself, we dealt with learning a mindset. And the basis was uh, a book called the Foundations for Decisions. So how this is connected to the two learning paths is something I'm going to let you know. We have discussed about this term in German, Haltung. If you enter that in social uh, media platforms, so they came up with uh, animal husbandry because that's it's a, a very versatile notion in German, or maybe posture. Maybe that is what is meant. You see that somebody sitting in a wheelchair will have a different posture than somebody who's standing upright and who might be looking differently. 
And uh, the third facet that came up was whether Haltung had to do with Geisteshaltung, that is the mindset, is it the brain or is it going beyond that? And the definition that I found that um, I think is uh, very pertinent is that uh, mindset or a position or a mindset that is Martin Palmatier, he said that. It's a reality filter that defines what we uh, focus on and what we can perceive. All right, so need to let that sink in. And uh, this is where the uh, mindfulness learning path comes into play. So to focus our awareness often means to take a position. Often we say between a stimulus and a reaction, there's some space. And that has to do with reflecting, with uh, pausing. And here we have the six attitudes from safety. That's a basic need up to a meaning about via status and values. And I just want to point out the sixth attitude or mindset, the systemic auto autonomous one, I recognize my inner multiplicity and subjectivity. So that requires some capacity to reflect. And this leads to the second uh, link, that is realizing our own multi multiplicity and the diversity how many talents do I have? And this is where the connection comes with the diversity and inclusion learning path. So how many talents do I have? How can I astutely make use of them? And if I identify them all in me, I can also identify them in others. So go through these two learning paths and uh, give a feedback uh, to uh, Hardy, for instance. And then in the uh, end, it's about communication. Communication happens at four levels. In the best case, if we talk with our brains, we have an exchange of facts. If we talk with our heart, then there's more of a connection that we create among uh, one another. And then in the end, we also have co-creation, which we have seen today already. And uh, my call to you for the next two days is discover the diversity in you and around you and make use of your potentials, your strengths and of all of those who are there. Embrace yourself and embrace the others. And this will lead to social cohesion as well. Thank you. Goodbye. Wonderful. I'm happy to pass on some intervals. So my Mastodon handle, a lot is happening. This is via Learning OS. So what is the most favorite uh, game for youth? Minecraft, a huge phenomenon. It always stays at the top. And I think the reason is that you can do so much with it and that there are so many different learn and game invites. I'm a preacher and a teacher at a university, but I also tested it with others. And I would like to show you seven basic types of mind tests, the didactics. And mind test offers just the same opportunities and capabilities as Minecraft. It's open source, so it is more adaptable. And for schools and education environments, it's completely free of charge. And that's great. So you can build uh, creatively, so you can have a building competition. We do this for Advent and Advent calendar. Everybody builds something, and this is then featured as a door, and these are such great things that we're doing. Then you can recreate things, something very simple, a church. So this is my Bartholomew's church, which I rebuild with uh, primary school children. Then you can also create learning adventures, for example, Mine Handy, that was build on our server and this is a game where you can see how mobile phones are produced and what are the pro problematic components and there's also a game which is funded by the EU is play your role also available on uh, our server and here you can have a rating game and this is the scale you can also build a simple quiz uh, many different possibilities 
And what is really very much favored are escape rooms, breakout tactics. This is just something that I did today, a digital rally that I did today, and we built it. There are many different possibilities, for example, areas where you have to gather knowledge within the game or outside, and it's not just to solve it, but to construct, to build such a game. And for this, you also need a bit of programming knowledge, because learning how to program. This is also something that you can do very well with this, because whoever is motivated to create such a, a gaming environment, they will also face things that are more complicated. Here, for example, the retro classic Snakes, which had been programmed by Mesocon, so this is a redstone for mind test. And then there are visual bots. These are very simple turtles that um, allow you to test visual visual programming. And media pedagogics are also uh, quite challenging, but doing videos is quite easy. The players are actors, then you record this with a screencast program. I recommend OBS, which has a lot of capabilities. You could even show yourself as a speaker. And here, for example, the passage of people of Israel through the Red Sea, that was great fun building it. And then afterwards also to do the film. And ready-made uh, game environment, there we've got the mind test uh, educational service. Uh, and then you've got the uh, center at uh, Baden-Württemberg, which you can order for three months. And this is not easy to crash. Also, Blockalot is a good tool for teacher. It's free of charge. A, a separate server which has been prepared with adventures. If you ask politely, you can also use it for other things. And if you've learned a lot, then you can also host your own server. This is also very cool. I must say that the hosting of a server, and I'm the administrator that is of the Mindtest educational server, uh, is more fun than uh, playing itself uh, with Linux. And I really developed a lot of capabilities I wouldn't have had before. So how you do this? Well, here you find the resources, how you install Mindtest and initial steps, first steps for playing and the blog uh, education in mind test gives you a lot of idea and you can also follow a mind test building in Mastodon. So those who start should maybe start at Mastodon. There's a lot of interesting to detect and I thank you for your attention. Perfect. Hi, Lati, at least virtually, from Hope. Okay, I think it's great. I think you will have a lot to do, and that's why you're not here. Yeah, really, I, I don't know what to do. I try to implement social learning in our organization with the concept and to establish that. It's a lot of work. Yes. It's funny, we do something similar. Angelica and myself, we're doing that. We are learning coaches, as you know. I do it uh, uh, full time, she does it part time, and our job is networked learning. And so we were approached, and people said, Listen, we need this, this, and that. And I said, Yeah, well, let's bring the people together. And it was fun. And we just see what happens because sometimes it works, sometimes less so. And we say failing is part of our job as well, it doesn't matter. We have a lot of freedom there. So we can try a lot different formats, and when something doesn't work, well, then that's the way it is. But Lati, really, for me, this is tautology. We do something, and either it works or not. That's too much hands-on for me, too much chaos. And then you say, you know how it goes, and everybody tells the others how the world should work. And it sounds like a lot of individual effort and work for your learning conscious. No, not at all. And it's not chaotic. This, you know, it gets sorted out pretty quickly. And I think it's great for people to try and be active instead of really imposing everything from the top. So they they know what they need in their daily stress and not general things. And we, we are happy to uh, fill blind spots, but we do not do um, uh, learning just in case. And um, 
you know, how it goes. The trainings are there, but not when you need them. Still, that we have a learning business partner program that we established with our own uh, learning circle on the program. It's structured and it's mandatory. We have multipliers for social learning. And given our size, it's very important to have multipliers in order to guarantee standards. You have no standards. And for us, it's clear. It's top down. We have clearly established goals. And social learning is super important. We want to establish that everywhere. And given our size, we are global. We cannot do this if we don't have standards. Where that's, uh, there's an Asian saying, uh, uh, talk dust and, and cook rice. But people always wonder why things don't work then, if it's a general standard for everybody. No, no, I don't need that. Just no. And we always have to um, build learning groups. And it works very well for us. We have the Learn Talks twice a year. And uh, in our town hall meetings, there are people who come regularly. And uh, most of the time, it works very well. Yes, fine. But Lati, to be honest, how do you want to know that the learning groups are effective, what the content is that is provided, and how do you guarantee quality? We even have measurable KPIs. You are right. KPIs. My favorite word. That doesn't work at all. It doesn't work with this, with learning. And how do you know what people need if you don't even ask them? Something is imposed from the top, and then they need to learn this. Or are they allowed to learn things outside of that scope? That's nonsense, Lati. I think that if people meet in a structured way, they find their topics. They don't need to do what we say. They will find their paths. But we need some order, more than what you have. It's really important that things are structured. No, we do this from grassroots, and as I said, um, for most of the time it works very well. And if it doesn't work well, that's how it is. And we don't ask our superiors, we are free. We just start and get going, and uh, when it works, we tell the success story. And if it doesn't work, we say it as well. It's part of our job, and we're not ashamed. But let you say, you see, I'm skeptic. We need you tomorrow as an arbiter at the book, and I'm going to present our approach, and I'll show you that it's a better one. Yes, but this is uh, tongue-in-cheek, people. Please get it right. Uh, hello, everybody. I've got the challenge to present the next cloud working environment. This is not that easy because the content is so huge. But what you might ask yourself, why next cloud? There's so many tools out there, Microsoft 365, Google and all the others. And the short answer to this and the direct answer is, is digital sovereignty. With Nextcloud, you've got the control over your data, where they're stored and what is happening with this. If you don't think this is that interesting, it's functionality because it's an open platform that you can run yourself and thus Nextcloud can become your personal digital work and learning environment. You can adapt it as you need it. And uh, we just heard a prescribed from top, so this is not the case here. You develop the platform as you need it and as you then become most effective. And I will give you a short overview of what Nextcloud can do. Well, Nextcloud, everything starts with the management of files. I can upload files, but in browser or in mobile and devices, I can manage it and administrators, I can share function, and also authorization, I can also classify documents automatically, I can have commentaries, workflows, everything that one would wish for or not yet wishing for, but once you think about it, you think, oh, this is really practical. And once the documents are in Nextcloud, you want to edit them with the Nextcloud office, I can not only work on these and edit them not alone, but also in collaboration with my colleagues. A further important point is the topic of group where their next cloud offers us the possibility to have calendars, address book, but also email administration. And again, this is in a fully collaborative way. You can share files with the appropriate authorization. I can also share calendars, address books, and shared mail inboxes. And here you see for the first time one of the big strengths of a platform like Nextcloud, that's integration. If I get an invitation through Nextcloud mail, then it's 
automatically integrated into my calendar. And once I write a, an invitation, I can immediately uh, have the link access to the um, email that is sent out. Then Nextcloud Talk, that's the chat, video, and audio communication platform. So in Nextcloud, I can also have group chats, one-to-one -one chats, video calls, and whole webinars can be hosted. And again, this is all on my own infrastructure. You might have often heard that many big suppliers uh, say, well, don't worry because it's end-to-end -end encryption, but think about the metadata, especially in communication, metadata, when, how often you do things are more important than the content. And for Nextcloud, everything is under your control and you don't have to worry about anything. Next topic, knowledge management, especially for this group here, I think this is an extremely important topic. And again, Nextcloud offers many, many opportunities. You have a simple notes app where you just take your notes also when you're on the go, but you can also have a complete wiki that is uh, collectives in Nextcloud. So again, you have, have a collaborative approach to the design of pages. You've got an editor, so you can jointly edit these pages and what's really nice, the integration. So once you link a document on Wiki and put it, it's only a link, but you have it as a tile, you can click onto the tile and immediately get there, or within the tile, you immediately can execute specific functions. Tasks I've already mentioned, that is tasks that can be integrated into task management. And here at Nextcloud, we've got our deck, and there again, you can manage your tasks also collaboratively. And this just as a short overview over what Nextcloud can do, but Nextcloud can do much more. We've got an app store with more than 300 apps. It's growing very, very quickly. So you can either choose your own app or you can participate in the collaboration or make your own app uh, available. So I just built the learning and knowledge platform the way I want it. And, uh, for apps that you are interested in, well, uh, how this is done, you can have a look later at the App Store on slides. And the question is, well, it's all interesting. Where do I get my Nextcloud? Well, Nextcloud is open source, so I can run it myself where I want to on the home server, shared host or whatever. You just go to nextcloud.com, download it and run the way you wish. If you say, oh, technology is a bit difficult, I can't do it myself. There are so many Nextcloud hostings offers. So look on the internet for Nextcloud hostings offers. And my tip is that it's really Nextcloud that it shows. And maybe even the Nextcloud partner logo is displayed. So then you know that they are not doing it all by themselves, but they've got us as a company at the background. Then it's stable, it's safe, and will work long term for you. And if these two approaches, both approaches are not for you, then just contact us and you will get more information. Okay, no summary, and I get back to you, Simon. Thank you, Simon. And first of all, thank you for allowing me to show my pet project. That is uh, the new learning path, the solving problems in a structured way. And as always, it starts with a problem. We have two people here. They say, OK, we have a problem. But they know how, to, how they want to solve it. And they say, let's go. First of all, they look for a team, if possible, diverse, with different perspectives and tools with which people can start tackling that problem. As a next step, the team gets together in order to clearly describe the problem, because only if I know what my problem looks like, I can solve it. Next step, once you know what the problem actually is, then uh, what the consequences are, we can uh, send the fire brigades, either the actual one or um, in a figurative sense. And then we can have a look at the roots of the problem in order to see how we can tackle it, how we can get a grip on it in order to come up with a sustainable solution. And then, in the best case, we can make a plan of which we think that it will solve the problem and which allows us to show that the problem is actually solved. Next step, then obviously we need to implement the necessary changes so the team rolls up their sleeves and to uh, solve 
the root cause of the problem and to uh, implement changes. But that's not all. They take the experience from this process in order to implement uh, improvements in the entire organization, to see what have I learned, what uh, is the new kind of knowledge that I have gathered relating to my system, and how can I make use of uh, these insights elsewhere as well. That means we have solved the problem, we have learned a lot, and then we can celebrate ourselves and the team. If you want to know how to do this, if you want to try this, you can do that because we have this no new learning path of solving problems in a structured way. For all those who look for details, oh, no, sorry, that was too early. There's another slide here. So what is part of it? The 8D uh, system from the automotive industry, and that's the benchmark in order to solve problems, combined with the Kinefin framework and parts from uh, design thinking. If you want to read up on details, you can uh, download this slide here and reach out. And if you say you want to know how to do this as well, or if you say, no, this works in a completely different way, then you are invited. There's a prototype experience in September 2023 where we will have a uh, guided uh, implementation of the learning path. And uh, I'd be happy to welcome you there. And I wish you a nice Los Con. Enjoy the evening and goodbye. Thank you very much for allowing me to give a talk. And for those who here who don't know me, networking is my favorite. So the topic of diversity and participation and transparency, this is what is important to me. And this is why it's about something very trivial, because I ask myself, what is the biggest problem in my learning experience? And that is that most people are afraid to share something, because they say, what I can share that is not needed by anybody and what I could share is confidential. So this is something that I see everywhere from the base of the organization up to managers. So if you then have a closer look, then you see that many, many people have a problem because there's so much, far too much out there, far too much knowledge, far too much information. But the problem in all this is an, uh, somebody who wants to know something has to rely on sharing that somebody has shared it. And we said 1% of the internet are active, 9% give feedback, and 90% just watch. But the 90% are those who say, I don't find anything. And I would like to give you some content for this. First about learning and social learning. I did so many projects, local and international ones, where it's about communication. Why do we communicate? At the end of communication, it is that somebody does something else or does what he does differently. This is a change of behavior and this is what I need to learn. And after learning, I need to uh, exercise this. The same is true for transformation. They also need to learn. Once you learn something to do it better, then it's a no-brainer. You need to learn. But even for support. So in many organizations, what's happening is that when uh, somebody's got a problem, uh, then don't touch the keyboard, call the hotline and solve it. And uh, at, at Continenta, I really introduced Office 365 with 4,500 people 20 years ago. And then we saw the fact that people delegated learning. They could never ask good questions. And then we made all this transparent via foray. And then people started helping each other. The third finding, uh, who wins? If I've got a problem all by myself, then I might solve the problem if I've got the expertise. But if I've got a complex problem, then I need diversity. I need colorful, uh, manifold perspectives to solve this problem. And this is uh, of uh, the uh, KU Eichstätt. I don't know whether you know them. He brought it, uh, pinpointed it. Social is the biggest brain of the world. I'm either networked with many, many different neurons that are active, and then I can solve any problem, 
All I know three experts and I've got their business cards and hope that they can tell me an answer. One size fits all for complex problems. We all know this doesn't work. So the formula is no sharing, no finding. And it sounds so easy, but this is the biggest problem that we have nowadays. Most people who do not find anything, they don't find it either because they haven't got the competence or it's not that, not yet there. Competence for learning. So I try to describe finding as a competence. What is happening when I find something? Well, the first step is that you have to know what you're searching for. And most people, how do they search? Well, they enter one word with Google and then they're unhappy about the result. And this is not searching and this is not a competence. And this is just, I can't do it better. So first, what do I search? Is it a person, a document, data or whatever? Second point, where do I search? When I look for people, maybe then I should start somewhere else than in contrast to um, people. Do you look for your cutlery under the bed? And then you wouldn't do that. And what do you, I know about it. Who created it? When? What had been discussed at that point in time? Which tools were used? And once I found the things, how do I qualify them? Is it correct? Is it the latest version? All these are things that you can learn. And many people uh, search something, find it, and after three weeks they no longer know where they found it and start from scratch because they didn't learn to refine what has been found via bookmarks and other. And last but not least, how do I improve my own content in preparing it in a way that it can be better found? So the learning journey in four steps. How does social learning work for me? So once I learned searching and finding, and this is a bit about community, and in a network it's a bit more opening. So I initialize the network through transparency and showing how to do it, setting an example. And then I will get into the direction of the tag group. I have a look at the different processes, and these have not come step by step, but this is the movement from I've got a question, I develop a network, and at the end of the day, I might get into movement with a movement. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear. <laughs> So, personal learning environment well, the dot of uh, Lila Rosa, they're different networks and in, cert in a certain way they are the result of people who have taught themselves, people who um, figure things out, um, to teach themselves and there's, ever since there was a, the internet came around there has, have been many, many people um, because not many people will have gone to a, a course every time they learn something. And how can PLEs help you? They help you visualize a document, how your learning process works. And uh, unfortunately, everybody has a different way of doing that. And obviously, that's normal. It, it's a good thing that everybody goes about it differently. But in our workshops and seminars, we always act as if everybody had the same way of doing it. And it helps to become aware of how we learn. And Felix and myself in our podcast, um, well, in our podcast we talk about that uh, regularly. And this, these are images that you find in the on the internet if you uh, enter PLEs in the search. And there are no structural indications. Certain people put it in drawers. Other, others uh, have the input process output principle. Here you can see that input processing output. This is what we've heard in the last two or three lightning talks. Generally, when we solve problems, we have developed certain procedures and input processing output can help you to talk about the uh, corresponding tools. You get things via a podcast or the Castro app or Deutschland Funk, and then they are processed. For instance, with Digo, this is a service where it can uh, note things. OneDrive is hard to avoid it, really. And Lumi. Lumi is there to edit contents. I use that a lot. And then the output 
is done, for instance, with Moodle. That's what I use. Or I make things available via OneDrive. For others, I I'll put it in a blog or share it on Mastodon then, or by uh, showing it in a structured way on my website. And this principle, well, gaining awareness of that. I would like to invite you to talk about that. How do you do it? What tools do you use? And what do you do with them? And that will certainly help one or the other to better structure their own knowledge and to be able to find it again. Thank you. Thank you, Guido. Hybrid work can be interpreted in different ways, in terms of time or in terms of space. And we said we want to have a lightning talk from a different time level, a pre-recorded one. And uh, Amy Edmondson has uh, been uh, willing to do that for us. And uh, we have a pre-recorded talk on creating psychological safety.